and uh, testified before both committees. And um, I'm, I really want to thank uh, Chairman Barra and Ranking Member Shabbat, as well as my, my good friend and colleague, uh, Mr. Whitman, for uh, working together to, to bring these two committees, which really, you know, when you talk about the Indo-Pacific region, um, you know, clearly um, is at the center, I think, frankly, of the, the work that we have ahead of us. So, um, so anyway, I've got to do the housekeeping, uh, you know, FedEx uh, commercial here. So, um, you know, start off by saying I want to welcome the members who are joining today's markup remotely. Members are reminded that they must be visible on screen within the software platform for the purposes of identity, identity verification when joining the proceedings, establishing and maintaining a quorum. Members participating remotely must continue to use the software platform's video function while attending the proceedings unless they experience connectivity issues or other technical problems that render them unable to fully participate on camera. If a member experiences technical uh, You know, really, if there was any sort of common theme, you know, whether it was the Arctic, the European uh, Command, uh, Southern Command, African, AFRICOM uh, Command, and Indo-Pacific, it, it really is that there's an erosion of international rule of law that extends into the maritime realm, uh, into uh, space, into cyberspace, into, you know, airspace. Um, and, and frankly, it's, um, it's something that I think it's an all of government challenge for the U.S. in terms of our diplomacy as well as our national uh, defense. Um, today, we've got um, you know some great witnesses to sort of talk through this issue, particularly in terms of the Indo-Pacific realm. The Honorable David Russell, who's Vice President of the International Security and Diplomacy at the Asia Society Policy Institute, also a former Assistant Secretary of State for East Asian and Pacific Affairs. In addition, we're joined by Admiral Scott Swift, former uh, commander of the U.S. Uh, Pacific Fleet, who many of us on HASC uh, know well from his service uh, for decades in the Navy. Uh, Bonnie Glazer, uh, director of the Asia Program at the German Marshall Fund of the United States. And Mr. Brent Sattler, uh, Senior Fellow for Naval Warfare and Advanced Technology at the Heritage Foundation. Welcome, welcome to all of you, and thank you for joining us, and thank you for your written testimony, which Again, I had a, re a chance to read through, again, really thoughtful stuff. But we're, we're not going to be able to go through it verbatim. It'll be a five-minute uh, opening remarks. But again, I just want to, um, uh, again, thank you for the great work that's there. And I just really quickly, um, you know, would just say that from the Sea Power uh, Subcommittee, uh, and Mr. Whitman, I think, can attest to this. You know, again, we have heard from, um, you know, combatant commanders, uh, certainly uh, Admiral Davidson, who's about to depart, the incoming uh, commander, uh, Admiral Aquilino. Uh, Harry Harris, who preceded uh, Davidson, um, you know, who all described, again, this, um, you know, much more contested environment um, in that part of the world. Uh, China obviously is, um, you know, pushing um, the rules and, and norms that uh, operate, you know, particularly in the maritime realm, realm um, far beyond what uh, I think uh, our country uh, de deems as, um, you know, safe maritime um, use of international waters. 
the island building program that they have basically turned handbars into militarized uh, islands that um, have landing strips, military um, facilities, um, and, and this is happening literally in the middle of COVID. Um, you know, we, we saw this uh, at uh, Woody Island, where again, uh, they installed a new radar to protect radar, um, new structures and solar panels for military use. Uh, again, this is far from the coastline of the uh, mainland of China. And what happens with these, um, with this island building is it basically extends uh, what I think is a totally um, unsupported claim of maritime control and closing off uh, sea space, which is you know definitely what we're, we're seeing in terms of um, you know our navy uh, 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 platforms that are out in that part of the world. You know I would note that in 2016, the uh, United Nations Convention for Law of the Sea Treaty heard a claim from the Philippines challenging. Uh, China's claim for maritime control, and um, and again the, they issued a very strong decision, unanimous, that rejected the nine dash line claim that China uh, posited as their authority to um, deny sea, sea access uh, to the Philippines. Uh, this was, I think, a very um, significant decision in terms of uh, reaffirming rule of law um, in that area. Unfortunately, the United States was not a participant in that proceeding because we have not fully ratified uh, UNCLOS, the, the Law of the Sea Treaty. Uh, the U.S. tried to get uh, observer status, um, even though we, because you know, we couldn't get party status. Uh, the tribunal refused to even give us observer status because of the, the lack of ratification uh, here uh, in the U.S., uh, and we had to rely on our ally Australia to basically be um, our proxy representative, our legal aid lawyer uh, during this whole proceeding. Again, the U.S., both in terms of the Obama administration and the Trump administration, endorsed the tribunal's uh, ruling. Uh, there's no question, um, you know, that they were right on the law. But uh, again, I think it begs a question, which we have heard from our combatant commanders, that uh, really, given, again, the contested environment that we're seeing here, again, not just in the Indo-Pacific region, but in other um, combatant commands in the maritime realm, that it really is time for the U.S. to become a full participant along with 168 other countries um, in the UNCLOS um, system. And uh, Admiral Harris, who is never going to be accused of being um, a soft uh, power kind of guy, uh, made it crystal clear that he believes that the U.S. should become a participant in UNCLOS because we lose the moral authority and the uh, legal uh, standing to really challenge um, you know, behavior like what we're seeing uh, with, with China. So later today, uh, myself and Congressman Don Young, uh, obviously a Republican from Alaska, will be introducing a resolution citing, again, all of the testimony from our combatant commanders in support of UNCLOS, uh, calling on the Senate uh, to move forward. Senator Hirono will be uh, introducing in the Senate, again, a resolution for ratification uh, of UNCLOS. And, uh, and that's why I think today's hearing is obviously very timely. Um, it's not really just a um, kind of a thought discussion, which is nothing wrong with that, but that, you know, there really is going to be, I think, uh, bipartisan support for moving forward uh, on this critical issue. So with that, I um, will, um, again, uh, turn over um, to uh, Chairman Barra uh, for his opening remarks. We'll hear from the ranking members and then just go right into uh, uh, the testimony of our outstanding witnesses here today. Uh, Mr. Barra, the floor is yours. Hey, sir, this is Sean Fowley from Has. We got to go over to Mr. Whitman. Oh, I'm sorry. I That was in my script to go to, to, to Avi. So uh, my good friend, Mr. Uh, Whitman. Well, thank you, Chairman Courtney. Joe, I really appreciate your leadership and thanks for bringing this to the forefront. This is an incredibly important strategic issue. And I also want to thank Chairman Barra and Ranking Member Shabbat for their participation in this joint hearing to, to better assess our maritime policies and how they're being applied in the Indo-PACOM regions. As we know, tensions with China continue to increase and even with intense economic ties, strategic competition with China and her neighboring countries continue to escalate. Using gray zone paramilitary forces, militarizing South China Sea atolls, intimidating regional partners, developing an ever expanding naval force, threatening to establish a South China Sea air defense identification zone and utterly rejecting United Nations tribunal decisions, 
China seeks to shift the regional balance and enforce an ever-increasing hegemony on China's regional neighbors. So I am forced to the conclusion that this increasing Chinese brinkmanship may likely at some point conclude in a violent confrontation. I am hopeful that saner heads will prevail with our nation's largest economic partner, but China's rejection of global norms and an ever-expanding intimidation of her regional partners foretell a different outcome. To address this seemingly preordained trajectory, the United States needs to take several steps to deter this collision. First, I believe the United States, in consultation with our partners and allies, needs to affirm the global norms that have maintained this long-standing peace and stability. And I'm pleased to note that the European Union affirmed their support for the United States in this strategic competition and expressed concerns for President Xi Jinping's authoritarianship to solving global problems. I also believe the United States should continue and challenge excessive maritime claims and continue a consistent level of freedom of navigation operations. I am particularly pleased that the Biden administration appears to have rejected the Obama administration's Chinese appeasement strategy and has also endorsed the continued freedom of navigation efforts. Additionally, I believe the United States needs to significantly expand gray zone competition. This expansion should use the entirety of our federal capabilities to include a more agile cyber response and a more aggressive United States Coast Guard insertion to better manage increasing conflict in the global commons. Finally, I fervently believe that the best way to preserve the peace is to prepare for war. To have foreign policy we want, we must have the military we need. Allowing our military forces to atrophy and diminish our ability to respond to future conflict is the surest path to war. Weakness begets aggression. And I categorically reject this path and look forward to addressing the administration's reduced national security funding later this year. In the words of Confucius, I believe the strength of a nation derives from the integrity of the home. I have faith in our nation, our democracy, and our ideals. Despite our differences, any strategic competitor should be forewarned that our will is strong and resolve is tremendously overwhelming in times of peril. Unleashing our strategic ideals on the Chinese communist, uh, communist dictates is akin to shining a light in darkness. Nothing can be hidden. Strategic gaps become evident. Again, I appreciate Chairman Courtney for having this important hearing, and I yield back the balance of my time. Great. Well, thank you, uh, Rob. And um, again, you know, we've worked together on these issues for many years, and um, I think it's an exciting time for both subcommittees. And now I'd like to yield to the, our other friends at the subcommittee on uh, foreign affairs on Asia and uh, uh, Mr. Mr. Barra. Great. Thanks, Chair Courtney, and, and to the ranking member. I could make my opening statement really short by saying I agree with everything that the, the chairman um, of the Sea Power Subcommittee and the ranking member just said. Um, when we think about the Indo-Pacific region, you know, the United States of America is a Pacific nation. And when you think about that region, it's home to nearly 40% of the world's exports and nearly 60% of the world's population. So it is um, a, a, a vitally important um, maritime region for us. Approximately 3.4 trillion in shipborne commerce transits through the South China Sea alone each year. You know, when I think about Chinese aggression in the region, you know, whether it's what we're seeing in the South China Sea, what we're seeing around the Senkaku Islands, what we're seeing in the Taiwan Straits, increasingly this Chinese aggression um, potentially leads to a, a misadventure and potentially a, a conflict. That isn't what we're hoping for. What we are hoping for, you know, we're fine being strategic competitors with, with China, but what we want to do is compete based on a rule of law. And... You know, I know I've talked to Chairman Courtney about this a, a bit and, and the importance of, of having that, that rule of law. So I, I do look forward to hearing from the witnesses as we talk about the um, about UNCLOS and whether the ratification of UNCLOS would strengthen our hand. The, the irony is we hold ourselves um, to these rules, yet by not ratifying that, that agreement, you know, we don't, we're in a weaker position to hold the Chinese to, to, to these rules. You know, when I think about, um, you know, the, the importance of this region, it's not just the South China Sea. I think about the, the freely associated states um, as well. 
and you know the historic ties to the United States of America going back to World War II, the importance of our engaging with the freely associated states is, is incredibly important. In addition, um, you know, I, I applaud my friends um, on the Congressional Pacific Island Caucus who have really been leading in this space. Representative Ed Case and Senator Schatz and others have been working tirelessly to advance legislation that would meaningfully benefit the Pacific Islands and help strengthen maritime security in the South Pacific. And as a co-chair of that caucus, I've been working closely with them on those efforts and look forward to moving them forward in this Congress. So again, knowing that we've got a, a number of members, I'll keep my um, opening statement short um, and obviously I have it submitted for the records, but I look forward to working with your subcommittee, um, Chairman Courtney, and you know the entire Congress to, to both address these issues, strengthen our resolve um, in the maritime space in the Indo-Pacific. You know, obviously, I'm thrilled that um, President Biden has raised the, the Quad Coalition, Japan, India, the United States, and Australia to the leaders level. I think this is a, a real opportunity for us to continue to strengthen that relationship as well as work closely with the ASEAN nations, the countries like Vietnam, Indonesia, um, the Philippines, and, and you know, continue to strengthen the, the security apparatus um, in the Indo-Pacific and in the South China Sea. So with that, let me go ahead and yield back, and I really am looking forward to, to the testimony of our witnesses. Great. Well, thank you, Chairman. And um, again, I think you know your comments really show how um, terrific it is that we're working together on the two, two, two subcommittees. Uh, and now I'd like to yield to your to the ranking member uh, of your subcommittee, who's from the heartland, uh, Mr. Shabbat, for his opening remarks. Thank you. And like uh, Ami, I could say uh, I could make my statement very short by saying that I agree with my colleagues, but I won't. Um, <laughs> the United States is reorienting uh, its foreign policy to center around the Indo-Pacific. And as we do so, it's absolutely essential to get the maritime security aspect uh, in the Western Pacific and the Indian Ocean uh, right. The waters of the Indo-Pacific are where many of this century's most consequential questions will be decided. Uh, whether a rules-based international order continues to serve as the world's operating system uh, or the region falls under might and right of hegemony. Whether the U.S. anchored system of alliances and partnerships is still up to the task of testing military authoritarians. Whether Taiwan will win a free country. And I don't use the term country uh, loosely. It is a country. Indo-Pacific waters face a wide variety of maritime security threats. Illegal, unregulated, and unreported systems uh, threaten vital ecosystems, economies, and food supplies. Most of the river systems responsible for the bulk of plastic waste in our oceans empty into uh, the Indo-Pacific. Radical Islamist terror groups take advantage of the Indo-Pacific loosely governing maritime boundaries. Most of the region's coastal states have extensive coastlines, but have disputed maritime borders and little capacity to monitor and police their maritime territory. It's a very difficult environment, but even among all of these challenges, one threat stands out above all the rest, uh, and that's the maritime belligerence and gray zone warfare of the PRC, as directed by the Communist Chinese, uh, Chinese Communist Party. Uh, the PRC actions in the Indo-Pacific waters are a clear reflection of the character and nature of our strategic competitor or our, our adversary, really, if we're frank about it. They show the CCP's uh, willingness to flagrantly violate international law. The PRC's fictitious nine dash line uh, territorial claim has been litigated and debunked in international arbitration, but uh, China has simply relied on Chairman Mao's old wisdom to make its territorial expansion a reality. And his words, political power grows out of the barrel of a gun. The PRC's maritime actions also show what little regard the CCP has for its international agreements. Since Xi Jinping promised the world in 2015, as we've already mentioned, not to militarize the South China Sea, uh, they've created over five square miles of artificial land and then stopped them with military bases. They show the CCP's willingness to trample the sovereignty of smaller nations. 
since early March, for example, the People's Liberation Army maritime militia has occupied the waters around the Whitsun Reef and the Spratly Islands with a faux uh, civilian uh, fishing boat, uh, boat a flotilla, basically, sometimes uh, numbering in the hundreds. Uh, it's a transparent attempt to intimidate the Philippines and a transparent example of the disdain uh, that uh, the CCP has for its neighbors. And the PRC's conduct in Indo-Pacific waters also reveals the CCP's military ambition. At over 300 ships, uh, their Navy has already become the world's largest, exceeding the U.S. Uh, Navy's 293 deployable vessels. PRC's artificial island outpost to the Spratly Islands are already supporting military operations far from China's shores. Dual use ports or outright military bases are already a reality of Cambodia, Sri Lanka, Pakistan, and elsewhere. Okay. PLA's belligerent uh, is growing dramatically. Taken together, we're seeing a long-term attempt to fundamentally re-engineer the strategic geography of the region, which will challenge U.S. access and threaten the security framework that has sustained the Indo-Pacific's prosperity since the Second World War. Thankfully, none of this is a foregone conclusion. The United States has both foreign affairs and defense options to check these threats, but doing so will require an overdue focus on the Indo-Pacific. Bringing the proper resources to bear, accepting that we draw the ocean and will have to take a hard look at our priorities, and not least, making the most of our Indo-Pacific allies and partners, which is a major U.S. advantage of the PRC. On that last point, I'd like to highlight the importance of the Quad, uh, which is critical uh, to this endeavor. And I joined uh, my, my colleague, uh, Abi, with the Quad recently, and it was, I think, a very uh, successful evening that we had. Tackling uh, this topic jointly with our armed services colleagues is an excellent way to continue this conversation in Congress. And I'm glad that we could bring our subcommittees together for this the hearing today on what is and will continue to be a vital issue for U.S. interests in the Indo-Pacific. Again, thank you for uh, doing this. I yield back. Great. Well, thank you, Steve, uh, for your for your great comments. Um, so we will now turn to our witnesses. And uh, our first uh, uh, testimony will be from uh, Daniel Russell, who, again, I introduced earlier from the uh, Asia Society Policy Institute and a former uh, Assistant Secretary of State for East Asian and Pacific Affairs. Uh, Mr. Russell, the floor is yours. Well, good morning, Chairman Courtney, Chairman Barra, ranking members, members of the combined committees. Thanks very much for the opportunity to testify today alongside my very distinguished friends and colleagues on this important issue. So I, I served our country for 33 years in the foreign service and from 2009 through 2017, uh, I was responsible for Asia Pacific affairs first on the National Security Council and then as Assistant Secretary of State. And my experience taught me the immense importance of the Indo-Pacific uh, to America's economy and security. And it also showed me the significant risks to those interests and to the interests of our allies and partners from the growing threats to freedom of navigation and overflight. I was directly involved in policy and uh, diplomacy on the South China Sea, East China Sea, Taiwan Straits, the Western Pacific. I worked closely with Admiral Swift and with other distinguished uh, defense colleagues. But despite intensive diplomatic efforts by the United States with Beijing, with the various claimants, with the littoral states, uh, the situation has continued to deteriorate. China, as uh, the chairman mentioned, has gone back on its word. It's flouted the legally binding ruling by the uh, UNCLOS tribunal in 2016. It's ramped up both its incursions into Japanese administered waters in the East China Sea and its threatening behavior in the South China Sea and the Taiwan Straits. And these actions are raising tensions. They pose serious economic and security challenges uh, directly to the United States. Throughout my career, Asian partners strongly encouraged, begged for a robust American presence as a stabilizing bulwark against Chinese bullying and hegemony. 
But in recent years, the perception has grown among many of these regional governments that the U.S. may no longer be willing or, or even able to play its traditional role as the guarantor of a rules-based order. And at the same time, China has taken a full-spectrum push through its Belt and Road Initiative, the BRI, to bolster its primacy across multiple domains. You know, through the BRI and, and through China's civil military fusion policy, Beijing is increasing its leverage over countries in the region. It's facilitating the expansion of its own Navy's logistics network. It's creating opportunities to collect vast amounts of data and intelligence. And potentially, it's gaining the ability to curtail American access to critical waters. So it's vitally important that the U.S. take steps that will rebuild regional confidence and uh, faith in the U.S. commitment, both to the region and to the rules-based order. Smaller nations will defend their own interests. They'll push back against coercion from a powerful nation if they believe that the U.S. is present and capable and willing to stand up for the rights of the weaker party. In my written testimony, I put forward a number of practical steps that the U.S. could take to bolster that necessary confidence. One is developing programs that will build maritime capacity and U.S. interoperability with regional partners. Another is building on growing strategic convergence with India and supporting India's capabilities as an advocate and as a provider of maritime security. But the most powerful would be ratifying the 1982 Law of the Sea Convention. Chairman Courtney laid out some very powerful reasons to ratify the treaty. Um, look, I'll admit that in isolation, just ratifying UNCLOS alone may not do all that much beyond removing a talking point from the Chinese script. But as part of a, of a strategy, a U.S. strategy incorporating diplomatic and military initiatives, ratification would have a powerful galvanizing effect and really bolster U.S. credibility and leadership. Uh, so with that, uh, let me stop. Thank you. And I look forward very much to your questions and comments. Thank you, thank you uh, Mr. Russell. And uh, again, your experience, I think, is really uh, perfect for today's discussion. And, um, and thank you for your great uh, opening remarks. We'll now uh, hear from uh, Admiral Scott Swift, who, again, I introduced earlier as the uh, former commander of the U.S. Pacific Fleet, spent a lot of time in this region and, you know, dealt with a lot of our allies and other uh, parties there. And uh, really um, pleased that he could um, join us from uh, Massachusetts, where he's enjoying uh, his, his new life uh, uh, having left the Navy. And uh, again, Admiral Swift, uh, thank you again, and the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Chairman, and uh, Chairman uh, Barra and Ranking Members Whitman and Shabbat uh, for the mem uh, opportunity to uh, participate in uh, this morning's hearing. I'm pleased to be before the committee today to testify on maritime security in the Indo-Pacific and the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. As was mentioned, I retired uh, just short of three years ago from a career as a naval officer, spanning 40 years from enlistment until my final tour as the commander of the U.S. Pacific Fleet. With the exception of a tour as a deputy commander of Naval Forces Central Command and three short tours in the Pentagon, my entire career was either centered in the Indo-Asia Pacific or I transited through it to the CENTCOM area of responsibility. Since retirement, I've remained active in national policy and security affairs with a focus on the Indo-Asia Pacific. I've submitted my full statement to the combined committee, which I asked to be made part of the record, and my comments today are, are pulled from those fuller statements. The point of my testimony today is focused on three recommendations presented with a practitioner's view of the challenges and opportunities faced within the region. The first recommendation is to expand the current focus of maritime security more broadly beyond the context of the Department of Defense generally and the U.S. Navy specifically. The challenges the United States faces in the Indo-Pacific are multifaceted and complex. They require a multifaceted and inclusive whole-of-government approach 
that brings to bear all of our national elements of strength to this problem set. While the current trend of the State Department being in the lead on foreign policy issues with the Department of Defense and support where appropriate is a positive step, other cabinet level departments need to play more proactive roles in coordination with the State Department. Further, Congress needs to be included more holistically if solutions are going to be relevant, especially in the eyes of our allies, partners, and friends, as well as competitors. To my second recommendation, fully understand the perceptions of those outside our borders who could have significant roles to play with respect to our own national interests. Their perceptions need to be treated as our realities. The concept of the rebalance to the Pacific was implemented when I was a 7th Fleet Commander. The resultant private discussions I had with my counterparts on their perspective on the value of the rebalance were overwhelmingly positive, as Danny reported. They were also overwhelmingly skeptical of the needed long-term commitment of the United States to follow through on the promise and vision of the rebalance. When I returned to the Pacific as the commander of the U.S. Pacific Fleet, invariably the state of the rebalance came up in my discussions with my friends in the region. Their common response being, we told you so. Today, those discussions have begun to transition from a concern for the legitimacy of the United States in the region with respect to foreign policy commitments to questions of the United States legitimacy. The last recommendation in tying these two points together is to recognize how important it is to move beyond declarations of intent, words of warning, and posturing. The United States is no longer being judged on what we say. We're being judged on what we do. To be relevant on today's global stage, you need to have a body of action against which your declarations can be judged. One of those actions this committee needs to consider is becoming a party to UNCLOS. I expand on this point in my statement for the record of how necessary it is to rethink the logic of the argument that the United States is empowered by remaining outside the convention and disempowered if they were to become a party of it. While I can't cover this important issue fully in the time I have here, I welcome your questions on the subject and consider consideration of my full comments for the record. While action is needed, this does not mean we need to take big, bold, headline-grabbing actions. We need to be consistent and firm. Many smaller actions are more meaningful than a few big ones. Those actions should be highlight should highlight our democratic ideals while rejecting the pursuit of force and coercion. They should embrace multilateralism as a rule, bilateralism only as uh, a fallback, while fully uh, recognizing that unilateral action sparingly when our national security interests are so compelling are followed while we take this approach when other measures have proven ineffective. I'll stop at this point, and I look forward to your questions in uh, the, the remainder of the hearing. Thank you. Well, thank you, Admiral, um, and I'm sure there'll be lots of follow-up questions. Um, our next witness um, uh, is uh, Ms. Bonnie Glazer, Director of the Asia Program at the German uh, Marshall Fund, and no stranger to the Hill, and it's great to have you here with us today, Bonnie. The, the floor is yours. Thank you, Chairman Barra, uh, Chairman uh, Courtney, Ranking Members Chabot Whitman, distinguished members of both committees, and uh, uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify today on what is really a, a crucially important topic for the United States. I devoted most of my career to trying to better understand Chinese foreign and security policy. China's maritime gray zone operations, which were mentioned uh, by Representative Whitman, pose serious challenges for the United States and our allies and partners uh, in maritime uh, East Asia. These operations are designed to gain advantage without provoking a conventional military response, and they are therefore difficult to counter effectively. Beijing's objective, to be clear, is in conducting these operations is to alter the status quo in its favor, and they have seen some success. In the South China Sea, China is employing gray zone tactics to advance its illegal nine dash line claim. And these tactics feature persistent harassment operations by Coast Guard vessels and maritime militia boats in the exclusive economic zones of other claimants. China stepped up military coercion against Taiwan as part of a multifaceted campaign that seeks to prevent that democratically elected government from pushing for independence and to erode the will of the people of Taiwan to resist so they will consent to unification with China. 
And of course, in the East China Sea since 2012, China has been engaged in an effort to undermine Japan's administrative control of the Senkaku Islands. International law can play a, an important role in managing maritime dis disputes, but only if the parties to the dispute are willing to avail themselves of the law. And the Convention on the Law of the Sea uh, has established norms of behavior among the majority of sovereign states. Um, and as uh, uh, Mr. Courtney noted, uh, ratified already by 167 states in the European Union. Bilateral and multilateral mechanisms uh, to manage and resolve uh, territorial disputes between China and its neighbors have not been very effective. China generally prefers to use power rather than law. And the July 2016 ruling by the Unclosed Arbitral Tribunal, uh, of course, found that China's nine-dash line uh, has no legal basis under international maritime law. And although the ruling was rejected by Beijing, a growing number of countries, including the United States, UK, France, Germany, jointly submitted a note verbal to the UN and also Australia. All these countries are condemning China's unlawful behavior and especially its coercion that prevents smaller countries from accessing their rightful fishing and energy resources. Beijing is also negotiating with ASEAN on a code of conduct for the South China Sea. Uh, but I'm rather pessimistic. Even if an agreement is reached, I don't think it will protect the interests of smaller claimants. And let's be clear that China has tried to use these negotiations to prevent the Southeast Asian states from conducting military exercises with any country that isn't party to the agreement and from joining with foreign powers to extract oil and gas. In my written testimony, I've included several uh, policy recommendations. I'll cite a few here. I think that the group of seven um, or the D10 should be issuing collective statements in support of the preservation of freedom of navigation, protecting the legal rights of all claimants to resources and opposing coercion and the use of force. Uh, sanctions, I think, have a role to play. Uh, the sanctions in, implemented under the Trump administration, I think were targeted uh, perhaps um, uh, at companies uh, that have already done damage. They've built the islands. They've already militarized. We should be imposing sanctions on Chinese co co companies that conduct surveys, energy operations, and operate maritime militia boats illegally in other countries' EEZs. And the goal would be to impose costs on Chinese state-run and private companies that carry out these illegal activities and induce them to change their behavior. Finally, I want to agree uh, with my other pa uh, witnesses, panelists here, that the United States should ratify UNCLOS. As a party to the convention, the U.S. would be able to strengthen its role in the development of the international law of the sea. Joining the treaty would give the U.S. a voice in the debates about matters that affect U.S. interests rather than ceding rulemaking to others. Staying outside UNCLOS deprives the US, uh, U.S. of an opportunity to participate in dispute resolution, for example. As a treaty member, the U.S. could legally challenge China's objections to innocent passage in its territorial sea. It could challenge China's straight baselines in the Paracel Islands. And as a state party, the U.S. would be able to nominate members of the Law of the Sea Tribunal and Continental Shelf Commission. So the benefits of joining on close, I think, clearly outweigh the costs. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify today. Great. Well, thank you, Bonnie. Um, and it's good to see you again. Um, uh, last uh, but not least is uh, Mr. Uh, Brent Sadler, who is a senior fellow for Naval Warfare and Advanced Technology at the Heritage Foundation uh, and a Navy veteran. Uh, again, I really encourage everyone to read his uh, testimony, which is quite exhaustive uh, on the subject we're talking about here today and uh, welcome him to, to the proceedings. And uh, the floor is yours, Mr. Sadler. Well, thank you. Uh, and good morning to everyone. Chairman Barrett, and uh, Courtney, Ranking Member of Shabbat and uh, Whitman, distinguished members of the House, thank you for the opportunity to join you today. A recent events in Maritime Asia definitely underscore the timeliness of today's hearing to highlight significant challenges confronting our nation on the waters of the East and South China Seas. In just the past few weeks, China's military, or PLA, Air Force and Navy have conducted significant and sustained operations around Taiwan. Signaling diplomatic displeasure, practicing wartime operations, and exhausting Taiwan defense forces. At the same time, over 200 Chinese fishing vessels, Chinese Coast Guard and maritime militia had massed in Philippine waters in what could be a pretext for a season of harassment. 
Last year at this time, and on the heels of Taiwan's presidential election and inauguration, the U.S. kept a heightened presence in the region. But it was events surrounding survey ship West Kapala working for Malaysia's national oil company that was most notable. Considering the location, China's response was muted, with the U.S. Navy always nearby. Regardless for countries like Malaysia, the economic and domestic political imperatives necessitate a return to these waters. Unlike the dynamic state of affairs in Southeast Asia, the East China Sea has Japanese and Chinese maritime forces maintaining a tense balance. Since 2012, the number of Chinese air and water incursions around the Senkaku Islands remain at historic highs, and it's fueled a shift in Japanese diplomatic and military posture. Japan's self-defense forces and Coast Guard continue to rebalance towards these islands, sustain increased defense spending, and revise the U.S.-Japan defense guidelines. What the Senkaku Islands and West Capella experiences make clear is that naval presence matters. Throughout these incidents, a sustained presence that included rare dual aircraft carrier operations was followed by a wave of positive regional diplomatic and partner military actions. However, such forward presence doesn't come cheap. For the U.S. to pace metastasizing risk across a spectrum of rivalry requires an invigoration of investment in our naval forces and operations to alter Beijing's strategic calculations, as well as Moscow's. It is also worth noting that in a remarkable display, China and Russia flew bombers together in the Sea of Japan in July 2019 and again in December 2020. And the two are set to renew a strategic partnership this July adding complexity to an increasingly stressing global maritime competition for our Navy. Given the intensifying activities in Maritime Asia over the last decade, what is China's intent? The Communist Party of China under President Xi Jinping has not been vague. It is a core national interest to prevent independence and, if need be, forcefully integrate Taiwan. To act on this, the People's Liberation Army, the party's military, has embarked on a decades-long naval expansion, adding 117 modern warships, while our Navy adds five, and executed military reforms with Taiwan being the principal strategic direction. That said, conflict engenders uncertainty, and so the Chinese Communist Party has preferred an incremental effort below our threshold for retaliation, while tangibly changing facts at sea in so-called gray zone operations. So what is to be done? First, presence for purpose. Naval presence needs to be prioritized and resourced more vigorously to decisive theaters such as the South China Sea and new tools for gray zone operations provided to our deployed ships. Second, build a new model Navy by growing and equipping the fleet to meet the combined challenge of China and Russia while recapitalizing shipyards and the workforce to deliver and man those ships so urgently needed. Third, deliver a compelling cost proposition by rethinking the conduct of diplomacy, building partner capacity, and economic development in order to make a more compelling and lasting cost proposition for our citizens, as well as partners, to join and strengthen the bargain of a free and open Indo-Pacific. With respect to acceding to the law of the sea, I have reservations. And given our track record and capacity to compete with the Chinese and Russians to date in multilateral forums in the near term, its efficacy as a mechanism to influence Chinese behavior in the mid and potential cost in the longer term, notably the seabed uh, comment that was brought up earlier. That said, the dangers at sea are real and no longer a distant concern. Both the current and next Indo-Pacific commanders, Admirals Davidson and Aquilino, both recently testified as much regarding China triggering a conflict in the next six years. To deter this growing armada, a raid against us requires more than matching numbers and arsenals and fleets. We must do this while also rethinking naval operations in a wider diplomatic and economic statecraft context, needed as an approach that confounds Chinese and Russian gray zone activities. Okay, mine did right now. And thank you. A new naval statecraft approach is needed. And thank you again for the time today. Look forward to your questions. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Sadler. And, um, and now we're, in, we're gonna move into the question uh, time uh, period. Um, and uh, again, just before uh, beginning or asking my question, I just would note that the uh, uh, U.S. Chamber of Commerce has actually endorsed ratification, um, and they obviously watch closely the issues of, um, you know, uh, mineral rights and seabed uh, access. Um, and and uh, actually, if people could mute their uh, 
their uh, computers, that would be much appreciated. Um, so, uh, and again, the resolution that Mr. Young, Don Young, and I will be introducing uh, uh, cites the uh, chamber's uh, position that's on here. Um, we also, um, uh, Admiral Swift, um, have a citation of a comment that was made by Admiral Harris, who was your former colleague when you served at Pacific uh, Fleet Command, uh, and again, was President Trump's uh, ambassador to uh, South Korea. And obviously a very um, vigilant, um, forceful um, advocate for U.S. presence in the Indo-Pacific region. Uh, he stated when he testified before the, the U.S. Senate, and I, and I quote, uh, I think that by not signing on to UNCLOS, we lose credibility for the very same thing we're arguing for, which is the following, accepting rules and norms in the international arena. The United States is a beacon. We're a beacon on a hill, but I think that light is brighter if we sign in fully uh, to unclass. So, uh, Admiral Swift, you, you made the comment about, you know, the, the benefits or advantages of being outside of unclass in terms of trying to, uh, again, um, solidify uh, international rule of law in the maritime space um, versus being a full participant. And I was just wondering, you know, using um, Admiral Harris's comment in terms of, you know, his perspective as somebody who really has spent, like you, um, many years of, of great service for our country in the Indo-Pacific region, if you could sort of expand on that, um, uh, you know, sort of balance uh, and balancing act that um, our country needs to uh, determine in terms of whether becoming a full participant in UNCLOS. Uh, thank you for that uh, question, Chairman. Uh, well, I, the first thing I would say up front is that I do agree with, with my friend uh, uh, Harry Harris's assessment then, and, and while I can't speak for him, I suggest that his comments, uh, if anything, would be uh, uh, further increased in, in his uh, view that how important they are. Um, I, I just point out to the er, everything that both chairmen have said already and the ranking members have said about how the competition is going with China. And speaking frankly, it's not going well. And it's on that basis that I suggest now is an appropriate time to revisit the ratification. Um, I recognize the points that others make about the downside of ratification, but I, I think they've diminished, have been diminished even further with the result of uh, uh, the current competition. As you mentioned, there's 168 parties that have uh, signed on to, uh, to the convention. Uh, being on the outside doesn't, it, it isolates us uh, from our allies, partners, and friends. Whether you talk about Five Eye partners, whether you're talking about the seven uh, countries that we have a defense pact with, and where it aligns us with are, are, uh, are those that are self-isolated themselves, the likes of Iran, North Korea, and Venezuela, while those on the inside, Russia and China, as Ms. Glazier pointed out, have free reign to define uh, the rules-based order within UNCLOS as they wish. And as you pointed, uh, we're excluded when it, uh, a, uh, an issue comes before the tribunal. I would underscore the fact that um, almost unrecognized is with re, uh, response to the uh, South China Sea um, a case that was bossed by the Philippines. Not only did uh, China reject the finding of the tribunal, they rejected the tribunal itself as having no standing. So if the international courts have no standing, this falls right in line with how uh, uh, Rep Shabbat has represented the approach that China has taken. Now is the time to step inside uh, the convention, I would suggest, uh, so that we're in more of a position of power to influence more fully this continued diminishment that's occurring in the international rules-based order. Great. Well, thank you, Admiral. And uh, I will now yield to uh, Mr. Whitman for uh, his questions. Do we have Rob with us? Um, Steve, if you're if you're uh, teed up and ready to go, uh, you know. All right, um, I'm, I'm, I'm here, oh, Joe. I'm sorry. Okay, sorry about that. I was just trying to get get through this different different things on the screen. Well, uh, Ms. Glasser and Mr. Sadler, I wanted to ask you specifically an issue concerning our freedom of navigation operations. As, as we've seen through the years, we continue to ramp up those operations. We started with doing um, three in 2016, and we are up to nine in 2020. And we continue to push back against uh, Chinese aggressive assertion 
and their unlawful claims that they can operate freely within the Chow China, China Sea and keep out all other forces. And their, their claims in the East and South China Sea continue to be even more and more aggressive. Uh, if you look at what they're doing um, with the East China Sea, ADIS, better known as the Air Defense Identification Zone, and they continue to push that, are very aggressive with intercepting any aircraft that come into that area. And now it looks like they're going to pursue a South China Sea Air Defense Identification Zone. So give me your perspective on how you see this, uh, this additional aggressive behavior, especially in how they engage U.S. Naval forces that are, that are freely um, operating under, uh, under the, the current law there in the South China Sea and what they're doing with the now, uh, uh, I believe, uh, upcoming expansion of ADIS. If you can just reflect on that and uh, would you recommend that the Biden administration continue the aggressive efforts that we have pursued with FONOPS operations and freedom of navigation operations and what we do to continue to contest their uh, assertion of the East China Sea ADIS and now potentially a South China Sea ADIS. So uh, thank you for that question. Uh, I will go first and then uh, sure. and then uh, turn it over uh, to Brent. Uh, I think it's an excellent question. I very much support uh, the routine conduct of uh, FONOPS. Obviously, this is a global program. It challenges excessive maritime claims. It's not exclusively aimed at China in the South China Sea. We also conduct FONOPS that are uh, aimed at demonstrating that uh, other countries, uh, Vietnam, uh, for example, does have some excessive maritime claims uh, and uh, even uh, are, are some of our close allies. FONOPs in the South China Sea are necessary, but uh, insufficient. Uh, and I, again, want to emphasize that the smaller claimants in the region uh, hope that the United States will stand up for the right, rights they have to exploit resources inside their EEZs. This was an important policy change that was made it, last July during the Trump administration has now been uh, also reaffirmed by the Biden administration. And I think it's very important. Uh, another point I would like to make is that yes, China has been uh, conducting far more exercises in the region um, and it is shadowing, as I understand it, US uh, ships everywhere in, uh, in the South China Sea. When uh, in 2014, the United States and China and other countries agreed that we would apply the Code of Unplanned Encounters at sea, uh, which has protocols to, to communicate when ships encounter each other. Uh, that uh, was useful at the time. In this new environment in which China is behaving more assertively, um, I think that we need to think about what else should be applied in uh, the South China Sea. Frankly, uh, China is not abiding by uh, cues, as I understand it, from talking to naval operators. In many instances, it is uh, simply not using them. And because it is actively shadowing U.S. naval ships, uh, th this is a, a change in the circumstances and the environment in that area. And I think we need to think about other ways that we can avoid uh, accidents uh, that uh, could happen, whether they be in the air or, uh, or at sea. Thank you. Mr. Sadler? Uh, thank you. Uh, great question. I definitely would echo uh, uh, Ms. Glazer's comments about our partners in the region welcome and need our, our visible presence as they execute their economic uh, rights and their EEZs. Uh, as far as mechanisms, there are mechanisms that have been in place for quite a while, hearkening back to the days following the P3 incident uh, south of Hainan Island in 2001. And this is the the military maritime consultative agreement where we meet with our Chinese partners uh, and discuss issues at sea and uh, in the airspace over. It has a mixed record. It hasn't met uh, in recent times, partly because of COVID, but also because of our relationships. Uh, but the, the freedom of navigation ops themselves and also associated operations, uh, special reconnaissance type operations, being routinized over the last few years is extremely positive. Uh, disconnecting those freedom of navigation and execu execution of military operations separated from uh, high-level engagements and other dialogues is actually very worthwhile. It depoliticizes what in the past has been a politicized, from time to time, politicized activity. And so that's a good, a, a good move, and that should be continued. 
uh, against any other resistance. What I would say on the on the flip side is it's also not helpful that when we do one of these exercises against a partner or an upcoming ally uh, to go public with these with these operations. It needs to be thoroughly considered and, and due diligence given before we go public with why and where we're doing these. Uh, the countries that are being targeted can see and they know where we are when we do these. So it's not a surprise uh, that our presence was there. But uh, a little bit more diligence on the strategic communication part is probably warranted. As far as uh, to kind of go back to the to the UNCLOS uh, commentary earlier, I am I am kind of the, the the odd man out on this. My focus is strictly on the the military in the near and the mid term. That's where I, more of my concern is, and that before we get into uh, UNCLOS fully formally, we should make sure that we're exercising and that we're postured to engage in effective legal uh, lawfare. In other words, that we've resourced, and and that record I'm not as sure is as clear. Uh, and with that, I'm, I'll, I'll, I'll yield my time. Very good. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Uh, thank you, Rob. And um, uh, and I just want to assure, you know, Ms. Sadler, you know, you're talking to friends when it talks about trying to uh, inc increase our presence and capability um, in, in uh, the, the Navy's um, budget and, and, and fleet size. Um, so I think Mr. Shabbat was having a little bit of technical um, Difficulty. So uh, uh, instead of so to keep it Democrat Republican, uh, I would now yield to Vicki Hartzler, who I think is the next in line. Uh, Vicki, are you still with us? I am. Uh, I'll go with the Chairman Mr. Oh, whoops. I'm sorry. My bad. I, I, I apologize. Um, I misread my text here from the staff. So uh, uh, I will yield to uh, the Chairman of the uh, Foreign Affairs Subcommittee on Asia, uh, Mr. Barrow. No worries. And, and this just demonstrates the bipartisan nature of how we're thinking about the, the strategy that we don't know who the Democrat or Republican is, is on this committee. And you know, that is something that we've talked about, you know, Mr. Shabbat and I, is we think about our uh, strategic approach to, to the Indo-Pacific region, you know, much as we had in the Cold War, we need an American approach and we need to play the long game. And I think that is a role that um, both of our subcommittees, as well as Congress as a whole, um, really can start to think about what that long-term strategy is from the diplomatic perspective, from the defense national security posture, and, and start making those investments and building those alliances. And that is part of the reason why I think it is important for us to be in um, treaties like UNCLOS and, and um, international coalitions so we can actually be at the table influencing um, the direction of these groups. Um, and you know, let me ask a question of, of Mr. Russell. You know, one of the um, multilateral coalitions is the Quad Coalition, and you know, this partnership, and I won't call it an alliance, but a partnership between the United States, Japan, Australia, and, and India. And you know, as we think about that from a strategic perspective, and you know, we've talked a lot about the um, the South China Sea, and certainly some of um, the Chinese incursions there, but also the Belt Road Initiative um, and with investments in Sri Lanka, you know, with investments in Pakistan, um, you know, port development in Djibouti. Um, if we think about the Indian Ocean region, um, you, know, you know, maybe Mr. Russell, if you could, you could talk a little bit about, you know, our partnership with the Indians, but also the, the importance of the Quad Coalition. Well, thank you very much, Chairman Vera. Um, I in my career admit to being something of a, a quad skeptic because it always seemed to loom larger on paper than in reality. My view of the quad has changed and I'm now a true believer in the wake of the very successful March quad leaders summit, the foreign ministers meeting that preceded it um, because it was very concrete in its decisions and its ambition and its outcome. Uh, and I think we can see that the quad now is uh, greater than the sum of the parts because uh, each of the quad members are, are contributing something uh, unique uh, to, in this case, the provision of uh, COVID-19 vaccines throughout Southeast Asia. Uh, I think that the quad more broadly, particularly when it comes to security in the Indo-Pacific, is very much a work in progress. And the, among the keys will be inclusivity. 
Uh, what we can't allow to evolve is a competition between the Quad and ASEAN as two alternate centers of gravity. Uh, over time, the Quad has got to work not only with the ASEAN partners in Southeast Asia, but very importantly with the Pacific Island nations as well uh, to look for uh, the points of common interest and uh, to develop a common agenda. So inclusivity has got to be a core part of these multilateral uh, enterprises. Now, what we see in uh, the Belt and Road uh, is the execution of a Chinese strategy to uh, ensure uh, dual use capabilities to major seaports that are adjacent to uh, important sea, line, sea lanes of communication. So we see that in Sri Lanka, in the Hambantota port, we see it in uh, Myanmar, in the Chapu port, in Pakistan, in, in Gwadar uh, port, uh, and so on. And what we need to be thinking of is not the emergence of Chinese naval bases. Uh, that's 20th century thinking. But instead, um, critical nodes where the Chinese can not only provision and support their naval vessels, but also that are integrated into sophisticated uh, technology centers through China's digital Silk Road. So uh, this is uh, data centers, it's undersea cables, it's what they call safe cities, which is a euphemism for authoritarian surveillance technologies and so on. And related to that is the tremendous economic leverage uh, that China is acquiring. So as my colleagues have made clear, really, uh, at at essence, what is needed is for the United States to be on the field. Uh, you can't beat something with nothing. The Chinese are bringing a lot of something uh, to the countries along the Indian Ocean uh, and throughout the Pacific region. Uh, we've got to do everything that we can, not uh, as Admiral uh, Swift made clear, limited to the military front, but through the whole range of diplomatic, uh, informational, legal, uh, and economic instruments available to us. Great, thank you. And, and if I may just ask a, a quick question of um, Ms. Glazer. I know, you know we've talked both about, you know, or around Taiwan, about the issue of strategic ambiguity versus strategic clarity. Um, and I really land on, you know, what strategic deterrence look like um, in, in this space. And, yeah, you know, perhaps um, you know if, if you could just uh, allude to uh, your perspective on you know how we approach strategic deterrence, not just in the Taiwan Straits, but potentially um, in the Indo-Pacific region. Well, thank you, uh, uh, Chairman Barra. That's it, it. It's such an important question, and and I like to think of strategic clarity and 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 strategic ambiguity. That is whether or not the United States would come to Taiwan's defense in a, in a contingency. As a spectrum, um, it is not just a choice between one or the other. And 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 I believe, for example, that uh, Secretary of State Blinken, when uh, about a week ago, made a statement that it would be a mistake for uh, the status quo to be changed by use of force. That that is an example of a declaratory statement moving more towards strategic clarity um, and away from strategic ambiguity. But it is not a statement that says, under all circumstances, we would come to Taiwan's defense. Uh, and, I, and I think that making that kind of a statement would be problematic. Um, it might, in fact, provoke the attack that we seek to deter. Because I think China's domestic politics are more complicated than any of us fully know. I mean, it's a black box decision making within uh, Zhou Nanhai and Xi Jinping's inner circle. And he is facing, I think, a very sensitive period now of this year, the 100th anniversary of the founding of the Chinese Communist Party. And then we have next year, the 100th, the founding, 100th um, uh, anniversary of uh, 
come, uh, um, uh, sorry, next year we have, we have the Olympics and then we have the party Congress uh, coming up in 2022, which is the 20th uh, party Congress. And uh, then of course we have in, uh, the founding of the 100th anniversary of the founding of the PLA then in 2027. So these are very important anniversaries and you should not, I think, say things that could end up provoking a Chinese attack. But your question about strategic, about deterrence is really important because the United States must do more to deter an attack on Taiwan um, and in other contingencies in, uh, in the Indo-Pacific. And right now, um, and there are others on this, uh, uh, I think in this hearing who are far better equipped to assess where we are in terms of our capabilities to intervene, for example, to defend Taiwan. But I would certainly posit that um, we do not have enough capability to get to the Taiwan Strait with adequate uh, military assets quickly enough. Uh, Taiwan also has not done enough for its part to prepare for its own defense and therefore to strengthen deterrence. So I agree with uh, uh, Brent's uh, uh, comments about investing in our military and particularly in our Navy. We want to avoid a miscalculation from China. But we also want Xi Jinping to wake up every day and say, this is not the day that I am going to put at risk all of my other ambitious uh, agenda items, uh, whether those be domestically or in, in the international community, um, and try and reunify Taiwan by force. Great. Mr. Chairman, let me yield back. Uh, Thank you, Chairman Vera. Um, and uh, so I'm not sure if Steve Shabbat is able to, to connect back with us. Um, Steve, are you there? Okay, it sounds like he was having a little bit of a difficulty there. So anyway, so now uh, I will yield to uh, Vicki Hartzler, who is next in line on the Republican side. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And this very, very important hearing. Appreciate all the witnesses. And I want to just uh, uh, continue on the thread uh, a little bit of what uh, you have been sharing, uh, Ms. Glazer, about Taiwan. Um, as you talked about, there's a persistent harassment that's going on there with the flyovers. And um, so I just wondered, you, you said they're trying to erode the will of Taiwan, so they acquiesce to reunification with China. Where do you see this going in the near term? I understand your your uh, advice that we've got to invest in the Navy and things, but do you see over the next six months, Taiwan continuing this very aggressive behavior or, um, yeah, what's your thoughts on where, where this is going to go in the next six months? Well, I personally don't think that China's use of force against Taiwan is likely in the next six months. Uh, but I think what we need to focus on is uh, the, again, it's the gray zone actions. This is coercion against uh, Taiwan, stealing away of Taiwan's diplomatic allies. Taiwan is now down to 15 uh, economic coercion against Taiwan. Uh, which has not been used very extensively, but we've recently seen Beijing lay down a marker in its ban of importation of pineapples from Taiwan. They could do more in that regard. They could put more pressure on uh, Taiwan's semiconductor manufacturing uh, company, which has become critically important for the United States and supply chains and uh, semiconductors. Uh, TSMC has operations on the mainland. And it's very much, I think, caught in the middle, supplying semiconductors uh, to China, but of course also uh, in compliance with the restrictions that the United States has placed on the provision of very advanced uh, semiconductors. Uh, so we see um, also, as you mentioned, the military uh, coercion around uh, Taiwan. So the, the United States, I think, both under the uh, administrations of President Trump and President Biden, um, have signaled greater support for Taiwan appropriately. And the Biden administration has talked about having rock-solid support uh, for Taiwan. There's recently been a revision of the contact guidance uh, with Taiwan, which is emphasizing greater um, is actually encouraging greater uh, uh, interaction and engagement with Taiwan while limiting and restricting that engagement in only a very, very narrow areas pertaining to sovereignty. What I think we need to do is multilateralize this problem more. Uh, we need to get other countries to stand up for Taiwan. 
Uh, we should be issuing collective uh, statements. We should be acting uh, together. Uh, more countries in Europe, uh, these are uh, countries who are concerned about uh, the future of democracy. Um, even uh, countries in, in, in Asia, who uh, Japan being number one, uh, would be concerned about a military takeover of Taiwan. Uh, and I, I think that the statement between President Biden and Prime Minister Suga, which included uh, reference to the preservation of peace and stability in the Taiwan Strait, is very important. So I hope that we can multilateralize this problem more, that China needs to know that it's not just the United States that cares about Taiwan, uh, but that they, there are many democratic countries around the world that have a stake in the future of Taiwan's democracy and in its participation in the international community, where Taiwan has so much uh, to offer in, in terms of its expertise on global health, um, and a range of other areas. And thank you for the question. Yes, thank you. And Mr. Sadler, you mentioned just briefly in your statement about China and Russia working together and exercising together. Um, I'm very concerned about those two countries obviously working more and more together and having similar objectives. Could you expound on what danger that you see or the extent to which China and Russia are working together militarily? Absolutely. This is something that I've been very concerned about and watching quietly for years and, and understanding both the kind of the nature of the relationship between uh, the Chinese in, in Beijing, as well as a, a long history with the Russians. It's not a natural relationship. It's not one that's very deep, quite frankly. So I've always been a skeptic that the two would ever come to anything approaching a real, in a meaningful way, part, strategic partnership. That all changed when I was in Tokyo for another conference uh, in the summer of 19, where the, the Chinese and the Russians conducted a circumnavigation of between Japan and South Korea, Takshima Dakto Island in the Sea of Japan. And, and that was interesting for me because it, it necessarily meant there was significant pre-coordination or planning between the two to pull that off, something I would have never expected, despite their years of doing very scripted exercises and very geographically constrained exercises still to this, to this day. Um, so from the, at, at the macro level, it seems a little unnatural, but there's something that's there that's, that's, that's different in the last few years that causes me a lot of concern. The challenge for the Navy is it's a, we have a global Navy, and we have responsibilities that are really principle-based, not territorially based. And, and even our economic interests are globally spread and diffused. So our Navy has a lot of bases to cover. And now you have two potentially strategic nation or partnership going on on opposite ends of the world that will overtax the Navy's attention and its resources. And so that's, that's, that's probably the most important thing I would take away from that is while China is definitely the pacing threat and the number one challenge, a, a comprehensive challenge, Russia is always there just enough to be a distraction at a moment that could be very, very disadvantageous for U.S. interest. I mean, comprehensive thank you, thank interest. You. Thank you, Mr. Sadler. We ran over a so, little bit, but your point was important. And uh, certainly those of us on sea power here, you're loud and clear. <laughs> so uh, next up um, is uh, Mr. Langevin, um, and then he'll be followed by Mr. Shabbat. Very good. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I want to thank our witnesses for uh, your testimony today. Um, so uh, let me uh, begin with Ms. Glazer. Um, uh, so climate change is obviously a major threat to the Indo-Pacific uh, countries, especially island countries. Uh, Ms. Glazer, uh, can, uh, can you talk about some of the effects uh, climate change is having on uh, the current maritime security uh, situation, and what new challenges can we expect in the future? Well, um, uh, I have to say, Congressman, uh, climate change is really not um, in my area of expertise. There may be other uh, witnesses who can speak to this uh, more in more detail than I can. But certainly across uh, the South Pacific, climate change is just the, the number one uh, issue. And uh, countries are looking for assistance 
in order to make themselves uh, more resilient. Uh, they are also looking, of course, to the leading emitters uh, of, 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 of these uh, emissions uh, to take actions in order uh, to, to curb the impact uh, of, uh, of global warming. And uh, so they look to the United States, and I think there was great disappointment uh, the United States and China is, of course, two leading emitters. There was disappointment in the lack of progress uh, over the last few years and a lot of expectations as to what can be done uh, going forward uh, in order to help these countries. So um, whether it's in, in terms of uh, uh, aid uh, that we can uh, give these countries um, or in terms, perhaps even more importantly, of expertise uh, together with our ally, uh, Australia, this will be critically important because if we do not step up, um, I guarantee you that China will step in and provide all sorts of assistance uh, to countries in the South Pacific. They have been incredibly active there um, economically, um, politically, and I think increasingly um, potentially uh, militarily. And there have been some, uh, some uh, suggestions that they may be seeking port access there. So I think this is an area where we need to really pay much more attention. Thank you. Uh, continue with you, uh, Ms. Glazer, if I could. You mentioned uh, that a, a robust effort should be undertaken to surveil, identify, and categorize Chinese maritime militia uh, boats engaging in uh, coercive actions. How would you rate uh, our efforts so far? And, and uh, do you believe that uh, we should do more using covert intelligence, or uh, would you place an increased focus on open source assets? So I'm not familiar with what has gone on in uh, in in the um, uh, classified realm. But in the open source area, there's been very good work that's being done uh, by my former uh, organization, CSIS, uh, as the Asia Maritime Transparency Initiative, and they are tracking specific maritime militia boats as well as Chinese Coast Guard uh, operations and uh, seeing how they gather together in certain areas to intimidate. Um, and the episode recently at Whitson Reef is just the latest example. This happens around Vietnam's holdings, around other Philippine holdings. We saw this at Thitu Island when the Philippines was planning and starting to repair uh, their runway on Thitu Island. So I, I think open source needs to be done um, it can be done with a great deal of uh, open source uh, uh, instruments, but I'm sure that in uh, the intelligence realm that we can do even more to identify which boats are operating where and importantly, what the companies are that they're tied to. And we can see if they are operating in different parts of the South China Sea uh, and, and, and they are sitting around places like Whitson Reef, they're not fishing. They are bullying other claimants. And so calling Thank you. I'm going to, I'm going to stop you there just in terms of time. I wanted to ask Admiral Swift, uh, our, our operations in the South China Sea will most likely have to be joint if we had to counter China, uh, China's increasing dominance. Uh, what were the biggest challenges you faced as the Pacific Fleet Commander when it came to working with the uh, other services and functional combatant commands? And, and what changes would you make to the Pacific Fleet's posture so it can fulfill its role? Uh, Rep. Langman, thank you for that question. This is not an area that I think needs focus. Uh, the coordination that's occurring amongst the component commanders has just been extraordinary in my tenure there, and it's continued. One of the benefits is that we're all located on island. I think an area to expand on is how we work with our allies and partners in the region. We need to understand their concerns with the definition of FONOPS. That may be a red line for them, but understand where their red lines are, set those aside for now, and let's focus on those areas where there's overlap and agreement. And I recognize the time's expired here, but I'd be happy to carry this conversation on in another venue should you have interest. Great. Thank, well, thank, you. Th th thank you, Jim, and thank you, Admiral. And, uh, again, uh, if anybody wants to see the, the coordination with our allies, I mean, I would encourage people to do a to try and participate in the CODEL during RIMBAC, which uh, is where I think many of us met Admiral Swift, which was a very, it's an impressive over 20 nation um, event in terms of naval coordination uh, that's out there. So next, uh, again, Mr. Shabbat's back with us. And after Mr. Shabbat will be uh, Congressman Sherman. Oh, 
I guess we just lost Mr. Shabbat again. Uh, so, uh, Mr. Green, uh, I think you're the Republican next in line. Can you guys hear me now? Yes, I can. Uh, the floor you. is yours. Okay. Thank you, Chairman Barra, Ranking Member Shabbat, and uh, Chairman Courtney and Ranking Member Whitman. And thank you to our witnesses for being here today. Greatly appreciate it. You know, Chinese, China's increasingly hostile actions in the Indo-Pacific are incredibly alarming and threaten international norms and regional stability. I'm particularly concerned about, of course, Taiwan. Uh, China has consistently denied Taiwan's existence. Uh, as a free and sovereign nation for decades, protecting the rights of the Taiwanese people against the CCP's aggression has been you know, bipartisan U.S. policy. Uh, we, we seem to, to agree on this, and, and I think it's actually one of the hopes that I have uh, for bipartisanship in this Congress. The U.S. has increased the frequency of its Taiwan, Taiwan Strait transits, U.S. bomber missions, and arms sales, but for far too long, the global community has isolated Taiwan in order to appease Beijing. It's crucial that international organizations and countries without diplomatic ties with Taipei recognize this peaceful nation and welcome them into the international community. The world must no longer give in to Beijing's bullying. The U.S. could help by prioritizing a free trade agreement with Taiwan, an initiative that would incentivize other countries to follow suit. Additionally, the United States must not forget the strategic importance of the Indian Ocean. And while in recent years our maritime presence there has waned, it is a crucial area for commerce and regional stability, and it contains three of the world's seven oil checkpoints. While China's growing presence in the Indian Ocean is troubling for the United States and our allies, China's not the only adversary there. In 2020, Russia established a naval base in the Sudan, giving Moscow strategic access to the Red Sea and, by extension, the Indian Ocean. We must insist on a free and open Indo-Pacific Indo and defend this region in our interests accordingly. Uh, question for really anyone. Do you guys think that, that we're doing enough right now? I mean, other than these fun ops, and I've, I've heard some questions on this previously, um, what else can we be doing? What else can we be doing to get our, our you know, allies and partners involved in this process to push back. And anyone, Mr. Stadler, maybe start with you. Oh, uh, yes, sir. Uh, so one of my last assignments in the Navy was as a defense attache in Southeast Asia. So one of the areas that I think is really ripe for consideration is in the, the realm of military capacity building and more sustained training and exercise kind of missions to kind of build up shared tactics and uh, procedures in really dealing with this gray zone challenge from the Chinese. It's also the Russians, but Chinese and South China Sea. Uh, that would be one area I think that's really ripe. And the Japanese for quite some time now under Prime Minister Abe have also recognized this need and they have coming into it as well. One other uh, question I had is, and Mr. Chairman, I'll just let you know, I can't see the, the calendar, so I'll need your help uh, knowing when I run out of time. But, uh, you know, in, in China's vow to bring Taiwan, you know, they call them a renegade province, you know, back into the fold, so to speak. Um, they're doing it diplomatically, isolating Taipei. I mentioned that in some of my, uh, my comments. How can we take that on? Uh, what can the United States do? What can the Congress do? I know we did the Taipei Act, the Taiwan Travel Act. What else can we do uh, to get the international community to to integrate Taiwan into the to community better? Ms. Gleisner, that might be one for you. Um, I, I, I thought maybe Danny Russell might want to, uh, to jump in on this, uh, as I've already talked a great deal about uh, Taiwan. Uh, but I think that we need to uh, be getting other countries to work with us uh, to uh, do things together with Taiwan. There's this global cooperation training framework where we include other countries. Um, uh, you mentioned a bilateral trade agreement. I would join you in endorsing uh, a bilateral trade agreement. We have to start by uh, resuming TIFA talks with Taiwan, trade investment framework talks, which we have not had since the Obama administration. It's a very high priority for Taiwan. 
but we should encourage Japan and Australia to be negotiating trade agreements uh, with Taiwan. And, and the EU should be considering uh, negotiating a, uh, an investment uh, agreement. My view is that for Taiwan, economic prosperity is equal to security. And this is an area where we have all fallen short and we need to do more. I'm uh, making an assumption here, Mr. Chairman, that my time is up. So it I'll is, and, but a great question. And you know, with the semiconductor shortage that's out there and the fact that Taiwan probably has the most robust supply chain for semiconductors, <laughs> that might be a good incentive for other countries to, uh, to get more interest. Yes, so, sir. Um, okay, so next up is uh, Brad Sherman. Um, and at this point, um, in terms of who's left on, on the screen, uh, he'll be followed by Anthony Brown and Jerry Conley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Our relationship with China reminds me of 120 years ago and the conflict between a rising Germany and a status quo Britain, a rising German naval power and a status quo Britain. That resulted in the uh, most enormous avoidable war in the history of humankind. And I hope we do a better job of managing our relationship with uh, China. Um, a military uh, deployments are very expensive. And that's why I'm pleased that so much of our discussion today has focused on ways to confront China without those deployments. Uh, Mr. Chair, I want to join as a co-sponsor of your bill on UNCLOS. Uh, Mr. Other Chair, I, uh, uh, as a, a fellow member with you on the Pacific Islands Caucus, I'm glad you brought up uh, the importance of us concluding the uh, uh, renewal of the uh, compacts uh, with the freely associated states, uh, something we, that's critical uh, from a strategic standpoint, not very expensive for the United States. Um, uh, uh, several witnesses have talked about the diplomacy, and, uh, cooperability, uh, and uh, uh, Finally, of course, we can help uh, Taiwan defend itself without uh, uh, that necessarily meaning that we have to build uh, more of our own military capacity. Um, we have some strengths in dealing with China. Our ideology is one of freedom and democracy. And we're now doing far more on global warming, as we saw in the briefing uh, uh, of the secretaries of state uh, just a few days ago. China's plan on global warming is to increase uh, the amount of carbon it puts into the air until sometime next decade. Uh, we have the relationships with countries and uh, China is dependent upon the U.S. market. Yesterday, we listened to our president explain the great uh, domestic needs of the country. And so it's important that we figure out how to deal with the issues we're talking about here without the expense of a huge increase in our military uh, in this area. Uh, a military response is the most expensive thing we can do when we don't use it. And then we do use it, it goes beyond most expensive to unparalleled uh, expenditures. Um, and if what, uh, my uh, first question is uh, for the Admiral, um, we want Taiwan to be able to defend itself. From Xi's standpoint, he knows that if he attacks Taiwan, how the United States responds is questionable, but the Taiwani, Taiwanese military uh, is there on the ground to respond. Um, what weapon systems should we sell to Taiwan? What should we encourage them to buy? And is there anything they want to buy that we shouldn't be willing to sell them? Well, thank you for the uh, for that important question. Um, I, I am actually heartened with respect to where uh, Taiwan is with respect to its own defense. Um, I, I won't name the individuals in particular, but I've had the benefit of having made two trips to Taiwan since my uh, retirement. And my comments to senior leadership there in a non-military context is to simply uh, share with them the importance of making Taiwan a bitter pill to swallow. As I've said before, the only thing harder than defending against an amphibious landing or an air assault is conducting one. The terrain of Taiwan is 
uh, best suited I, I, for I, I, defense. I've got limited time. Are there particular weapon systems? Uh, so I would I would say defense. defensive weapons. Those weapons that can de defeat an amphibious landing or an air assault, as well as weapons to defend against missile attack. Uh, thank you. I want to move on. Uh, uh, Chair of the, uh, along with uh, Mr. Shabbat, uh, who's also with us of uh, the, uh, the India Caucus. I know Chairman Vera has served as uh, chair of that caucus as well. Um, our focus has mostly been on the Pacific, but this we're focusing here on the Indo-Pacific. Uh, Admiral, is there a problem with the Indian Ocean being divided uh, uh, between the Indo-Pacific Command, Central Command, and uh, Africa Command? I haven't seen it manifest itself. There's great collaboration across that line at the COCOM level as well as at the individual component level. So that's that's wasn't an issue when I've served on both sides of that line. And I think that will be the final word. So uh, thank you, uh, Brad, for those questions. And um, so uh, next up is uh, Mr. Brown, uh, Anthony Brown. You're next in line. Th thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. And um, I'm not sure uh, who best to answer this question, so I'll leave it to the panelists, uh, perhaps uh, uh, to do, you know, if they're able to answer it, please do. Um, currently, the U.S. Uh, Defense Logistics Agency, DLA, purchases uh, some of its fuel for Indo-Pacific operations from foreign suppliers and is delivered on foreign flagships with foreign crews. Uh, my concern is the availability and reliability of that. Uh, in um, uh, a, a conflict uh, with 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 China uh, in the Indo-Pacific, um, can you comment on you know whether increasing fuel purchases from U.S. suppliers and requiring the delivery of U.S. flagships uh, make sense in increasing reliability uh, and availability of fuel uh, in time of great time of need or in a surge? Uh, Congressman Brown, Admiral Smith, I'll respond uh, quickly and, and say that this, the, if that is a concern. You're rightful to have that concern. It's a, rec it's a concern that's shared by the Joint Staff. I've had discussions with the J-4 in particular about um, these vulnerabilities. And diversity of fuel stocks and supplies broadly is being strongly endorsed by both the Joint Staff. And I can only speak for the Navy. I just participated in a Navy-Marine war game on that specific issue recently. Um, do any of the other um, panelists uh, want to comment on that? Yeah, absolutely. So this is a Brent Sadler. I, I as also a, a, a Westpac sailor myself, and operated in the Western Pacific. This is a this is a concern, especially if a conflict is prolonged uh, in the going from months into years, as it might be with uh, China. So those logistics need to be very resilient uh, in supply, but also in transit or transport. So more sea lift and more availability for wartime of tankers as well. And, and is it your view that, uh, or anyone's view that uh, this is something that uh, the Navy could take up itself or do they need uh, guidance or direction from Congress to do this? Uh, at least it's my expectation. Does that mean increasing um, purchases, procurement of fuel from U.S. suppliers on U.S. vessels with U.S. crew? Well, and well, in that regard, I think it probably has to come from outside of the Navy. Uh, if I mean, because I guess my initial argument would be go where the best, the best quality and the best price would be the first thing. And then at the same time, this is where Congress can come and make sure there's more resiliency in the logistics, the supply networks, both here in the United States as well as forward. Uh, thinking that uh, the assumption being that your sea lanes do get cut at some point in time, you have to have that forward access as well. And does anyone else uh, I want to comment on that uh, issue or question? I, I would strongly advocate for engaging with the Navy to get the Navy's perspective. There are both uh, upsides as downsides as well. You want diversity in, in your uh, uh, logistics, the sources. Um, I recognize that there certainly is a perspective from uh, buying those sources from uh, the U.S. perspective, from U.S. suppliers. Uh, but there are downsides and risks associated with that. Uh, the tyranny of distance comes to mind. I would recommend starting that conversation with the Navy to understand what their requirement is, expand it from there, you know, how you might be able to diversify it further. 
Congressman Brown, this is Danny Russell. If I could offer uh, one thought, it's that this is really a subset of a broader issue of U.S. access and logistic options, not only in a period of conflict, but in a in a period of tension when the uh, tremendous influence that China has uh, acquired among the littoral countries in the Indo-Pacific uh, makes them think twice about extending the kind of overflight or port access that the United States has historically taken for granted. And the cure for that is not just by America, it's for America to be in the game in the region diplomatically, economically, and in other respects. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. If there's no one else that wants to uh, comment on that, I'll yield back the balance of my time. And I appreciate well, uh, the time thank you, uh, from our panel. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll make a quick comment, which is the last year's NDAA, we finally restarted a maritime tanker program to, to really um, address this issue, as well as the maritime security program, which is using US flagged ships to, to boost um, that supply chain. But we've got more work to do. And I look forward to doing that with you on Sea Powers Mark this year. Um, so next up is uh, Andy Levin, uh, and he'll be followed by Jerry Conley. All right, thanks, Mr. Chairman. Good to see you. And I really thank all witnesses for joining us today. Um, I wanna talk about some of the implications that China's activities in the Indo-Pacific have for human rights and the health of the environment in the region. There was an NBC News investigation published last year, and it found that China had been sending industrial fishing boats to fish illegally off the coast of North Korea. Those findings explained a horrible mystery wherein beat up wooden boats, more than 500 of them between 2015 and 2020, would wash up on the shore in Japan and in them were skeletons of North Korean fishermen. NBC News reported that Chinese fishing vessels had displaced the fishermen's much smaller boats, leading them to take major risks and go farther and farther out to sea to try to catch fish and they would be stranded and have these tragic consequences. So. Let me open up this question to any of our witnesses. This is obviously a grim and alarming example of the humanitarian risk posed by China's malign activities in the Indo-Pacific. What should the U.S. do to address this kind of situation? Congressman, Admiral Swift here, I'll jump on this quickly, but I, but I know both Bonnie and Danny are well-versed in this. I want to come back to a comment that Bonnie made earlier about this gray zone that not only is CSIS and Greg Poling is is the individual that has done some incredible work there, um, but as well, uh, uh, um, Andrew Erickson at the uh, Center for Maritime uh, China Studies at the War College, the, the term is the People's Armed Forces Maritime Militia. This is an organized paramilitary force. They fish sometimes for their own benefit. But when called, they, they are at the behest, really, of Xi Jinping directly. There's a chain of command. And what you're seeing them doing are efforts on their own to displace others. We've seen this, the Indian Ocean was mentioned. We've seen it around Gwadar, and we've seen it around Djibouti. Um, so this is not a global force, but it certainly spans the area of interest of China from uh, the Babel Mandeb all the way up into the Sea of Japan. Uh, so I completely agree with the assessment that you've shared here, that this is something that needs to be looked at more broadly. Congressman, I'll follow Admiral uh, Swift, who uh, went uh, with me, or I went with him, as we traveled throughout the Pacific Islands, meeting with governments there to talk about uh, the very relevant issue of illegal unregulated fishing uh, and the incursions in their national EEZs uh, by, among others, uh, the Chinese uh, who are overfishing uh, and badly damaging the uh, ecology of the Pacific. This connects also to Congressman Langevin's uh, question about climate change because extreme weather flooding the, and the shifts in the fish stock, which is a principal pr source of protein throughout the region uh, have huge strategic uh, implications. So in terms of what 
there's not much we can do for the North Koreans, I'm sorry to say, although this shows what it means to have China as an ally. Uh, but there's a lot that we can do for the Pacific Island nations. And there's a lot that we can do for the uh, other littoral states, in, particularly in the South China Sea, uh, by way of assistance in uh, fishing agreements, the diplomatic piece to it, um, maritime domain awareness, uh, EEZ protection, small uh, patrol crafts, training, access to fuel, and so on. And I think that uh, a sustained U.S. effort uh, to provide the kind of modest assistance that the countries are asking for and desperately need would have huge strategic positive effects and would, uh, to some degree, curtail China's freedom of action. Well, that's, I, you know, I pre, I, obviously I'm very supportive of providing that aid because the other example I was going to give you was the Pacific Flying Squid, which I believe Japan has been overfishing. The NBC News report included some information about that. Um, and that the since, you know, I guess in about the last just less than 20 years, the squid population has declined in South Korean and Japanese waters by more than 70 percent. And, you know, Global Fishing Watch attributes that to this illegal Chinese fishing. So I think this is something we really for ecology, for the climate and for sustaining human populations with protein, we really have to take this seriously. Great. Well, thank you, Andy. And, um, you know, again, it's really nice to see, again, sort of a, a you know diplomatic and military perspective in terms of how, you know, that's really the way we hopefully can address um, all these issues. Um, so next up is uh, Mr. Conley from Virginia, and he'll be followed by um, his colleague from Virginia, Elaine Lurhea. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and thank you to our panel, very thoughtful. Um, Mr. Russell, let me begin with you. You stressed uh, how important it was to ratify UNCLOS, the uh, Lobo Sea Treaty, in your testimony. Um, I vividly remember uh, then Jesse Helms, the late Senator Jesse Helms, um, just browbeating, I believe it was Tom Pickering, who had been the chief U.S. negotiator for Law of the Seas, uh, to try to get him to almost renounce his support for his own treaty. Um, that was the climate in the U.S. Senate, unfortunately, with respect to the treaty. By not ratifying, as you point out, we created an enormous void that China has been only too happy to fill. You talked about it in sort of broader terms, but maybe you could talk about some of the specific things we lose out on by not engaging in law of the seas. They have lots of structures and committees and subcommittees we're not members of. We don't have any influence or voice really in a lot of that, and China does, and China has exploited that. And, and that, that goes to, you know, uh, ore nodules in the sea, harvesting natural resources, navigational policies, and so forth. Could you just talk a little bit about some of the specific costs to us that are not in our interest, those costs, uh, that we lose because we're not a member of the Law of the Sea Treaty? Thank you, Congressman Connolly. Uh, and uh, Tom Pickering was my boss for many years in the Foreign Service and a, a true champion of U.S. interests, including in negotiating on close. Um, look, I think that uh, Bonnie Blazer's paper it contains a number of the very specific uh, steps uh, uh, that would advantage the United States uh, were we to ratify and that we're disadvantaged. Uh, I won't try to recreate all of them, but certainly uh, our inability to weigh in in support of the Philippine uh, pleading to the tribunal uh, revealed a, a major weakness uh, that flows from our uh, self-exile along with North Korea and a few other unsavory states from UNCLOS uh, uh, membership. Um, I think that it also means that the Chinese have a much wider uh, purview for nominating individuals uh, to uh, senior positions and positions of uh, decisive influence within uh, the UNCLOS system. Uh, it simply removes us from the platform where issues that are directly germane to our economic and security issues are being adjudicated. And Congressman, this is part of a broader trend 
uh, in multiple mu multilateral fora, uh, institutional organizations and so on, uh, the Chinese have stolen a march on the U.S. in the, their ability to uh, gain positions of uh, control as director generals of specialized agencies uh, and really are stacking the deck. Uh, and uh, Mr. Russell, Mr. Russell, because of my time, I get that. And I think all I could say is I do think that when we talk about law of the sea, we need to be speaking in specifics in terms of what the United States is not influencing and is losing out on and the Chinese are gaining. Uh, the more we can be specific, the more people get the value of the treaty. And I think we have to move beyond, well, the U.S. prestige and influence to no, there are specific costs to the United States interests, and here they are. And the Chinese are taking advantage of that and benefiting from it at our expense. Um, and I, I just think we, we need to revisit this issue, and I'm so glad you pointed that out in your testimony. Thank you. Uh, given the interest of time, Admiral, uh, you're in Massachusetts. I'd love to know where. I'm from Massachusetts. But I wonder if you could just address how far should the United States and is the United States prepared to be aggressive in asserting its rights in the South China Sea? Uh, and how aggressive are we or should we be in protecting our allies' territorial jurisdictions? Because um, con conflict, conflict is an ever-present likelihood with China. Yes. Uh, so, easy question. I'm in Westport, Mass. But more specific to, your, to the question that you asked, I, I think, ask the questions of yourselves. I've said many times as the PAC fleet commander that what I needed more than anything else was policy relief. Deterrence is the nation's ability to act. Uh, I think readiness, as the CNO pointed out, is the most critical element. We're going to have to fight with the force that we have, but it's that commitment to use that force that comes from the civilian control of the government that's most important. And I note the time has expired, so I'll pause there. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just, I think we, we, I think the United States has to obviously assess how much risk are we willing to take. Um, I, I'm for an aggressive posture with respect to the Chinese because otherwise they de facto create South China Sea as a Chinese lake. Um, and that steps a lot of toes, included allied or partner toes. But we need to, as a country, have a cold hearted, or clear-eyed look at what risks are we prepared to take. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Jerry. And watching Admiral Swift nodding his head shows that I think you kind of posed the question of the day. So thank you. Um, so uh, next up is, um, uh, let's see, uh, uh, Elaine Luria. I, mean, I apologize, Elaine. You're up. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman um, and Mr. Sadler. Uh, nice to see you. Um, Last month, I wrote a letter to President Biden um, detailing the need for a sense of urgency in countering the real and proximate threat uh, that exists from China today in the Western Pacific. And I see you provided in your statement, you echoed my call for a Battle Force 2025, a plan to address today's challenges in the region. And you also note in your statement that the Navy struggles to maintain a persistence persistent presence um, at the critical crossroads of the Pacific and Indian Oceans with little more than two warships on any given day. Yet just yesterday, uh, the CNO continued to call for reducing the size of the fleet in the near term in order to provide funding for programs in the future by getting rid of what he terms as legacy platforms. Um, I'd like to start with some simple yes, no questions. Um, do you agree that naval presence matters to counter Chinese activity in the Indo-PACOM AOR? Uh, yes, absolutely. And do you agree that it requires ships in order to have this presence? Yes, uh, absolutely. Again, but yes, not so, in, but not in isolation. Um, I'm with Swift. Um, in your statement, you also noted uh, that the nation's commitment to their shared strategic vision for a free and open maritime domain is the use of their military resources to underscore their resolve. And when you took command of Pacific Fleet in 2015, the People's Liberation Army, Navy, the PLAN, had 255 Battle Force ships in its fleet, according to ONI. And today that number is 360. And in just a few more years, it'll, it'll be over 400. Um, the Chinese continues to pursue and build on their illegal maritime planes in the region, along with their artificially imposed nine-dash line. 
And I would argue that persistence US naval presence in the region is the best way to push back on these claims. So I'll ask you the same question. Do you agree that naval presence matters in the Indo-PACOM AOR? I do very much so. And do you agree that it requires ships to have this presence? Absolutely. Um, and in order to provide this urgently needed presence in uh, the Indo-PACOM AOR and in the Western Pacific specifically, do you think it's prudent to decommission ships with remaining life, uh, such as our cruisers and our LCS, when remaining platforms are years away, essentially decommission ships faster than we can replace them? Um, it depends. It's a complicated question. It's what are the trades that we're buying uh, for reducing the number of ships. If they're not relevant in today's conflict, then it makes sense to me. But I, I would need more time to uh, share the details behind. Okay. I mean, just uh, quickly referring to the cruisers, do you think that our cruiser fleet remains relevant in uh, the current environment? If you're talking about some of our older cruisers, you can see the challenge it has to maintain them. We've had one in particular, I'm sure Rep Whitman understands this since it's right in his front yard, uh, trying to get that cruiser underway was very problematic because of its age. Yes, I understand the Vela Golf based here out of Norfolk in, in my district and um, I'm tracking closely on the cruiser modernization. Um, but you know, just wanted to focus on the fact that in order to be present, we need to have enough ships. And I think that whatever we do over the next four years will ensure either the US maintains maritime superiority in the Western Pacific or we cede that to China. And I feel that we desperately need a national defense strategy that acknowledges and prioritizes the maritime nature of this current strategic environment. Um, and, you know, Mr. Sadler, I know you've written extensively on this for the Heritage Foundation. Can you comment? Do you think the Navy has provided that plan today? I think Navy ne needs to do a better job of getting that plan out. Uh, there's been a lot of due diligence that's done internally, looking at the engineering and the budget. Uh, uh, elements of the equation, but Navy net definitely needs to do a better job of getting that message out. Um, so I've had some time to review the uh, future Naval Force study uh, structure study and, and other documents from the Navy and every single 1 of these, they use a going in assumption that this is all we're going to get. We're going to start with the fact that we're only going to see 2.1% growth and then we're going to buy what we can buy um, out of that allocation um, that they assume they're going to get. Do you feel like. They're self constraining themselves rather than coming to the table and telling Congress, telling the American people, you know, what force, what fleet we need, something along the lines of the 1984 maritime strategy that Secretary Lehman presented in the Reagan administration. Do you feel like that's lacking? Uh, yes, I agree very much with that assessment, with your assessment on that. I think it would be better to start with a threat informed or threat led uh, uh, analysis that then is budget informed but not the other way around. And then of course, at the end, having something that's structured around an effective strategy. So those three things have to go together, but the budget can't be the front end. We have to focus in on a military efficiencies and resiliency and strategic effectiveness first. Okay, well, thank you for sharing those comments and um, appreciate following your work with the Heritage Foundation. And thank you all uh, the witnesses for being here today. And I yield back. Great. Thank you, Elaine. And uh, I'm now uh, going to recognize uh, Congresswoman uh, Houlihan, and I also am going to uh, hand off the, uh, the gavel to uh, Mr. Barrett because I have a family commitment that I'm, I've got to jump off. I want to thank all the witnesses and all the members for their participation in uh, what I think, again, is, is going to be a dominant um, priority for uh, both of our subcommittees as well as Congress as a whole. So, uh, Congresswoman uh, Houlihan, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to all of the witnesses and panelists. Um, my first question is for Mr. Russell. Uh, just this morning, several of my colleagues uh, on a different subcommittee for the HAS were looking very closely at the importance of securing our rare earth element supply chain. I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about the possibilities and feasibility of deep sea mining uh, for rare earth elements and how the UNCLOS would possibly manage or, or, or talk into this process. And are you, uh, if, if in fact you uh, are, have any input on that, are you also aware of any other nations who are, are experimenting with this uh, uh, undersea uh, mining? Well, thank you, uh, Congressman Houlihan. Um, I regret I don't uh, know what the right answer is to uh, your pair of questions. Um, I do know, though, that uh, not only are the uh, Chinese seeking to sustain a virtual monopoly on rare earths uh, uh, and have they and have a record of using rare earths 
as leverage uh, specifically against uh, Japan in, in economic retaliation for political acts, but that they are um, aggressively exploring uh, undersea mineral uh, mining uh, in both the South China Sea and also they would like to do so in the Arctic. And I believe that, uh, you know, at a minimum, uh, uh, ratification of UNCLOS would put the United States in a position to be able not only to uh, contest uh, Chinese behavior uh, within the, the legal context of uh, UNCLOS, um, but to raise the effectiveness of our broader political and diplomatic uh, effort to shine a spotlight on problematic Chinese behavior. That was, in fact, the recommendation and the conclusion of the panel that we were speaking with today regarding the same real concern over access to rare earth elements and processing rare earth elements. And also, uh, their recommendation was definitely to uh, get back in, or get involved into the unclassed process and the ratification thereof. Um, you led me into my second question, and I, I'm going to ask Mr. Sadler. Uh, this and then if, if you have anything to contribute or add, I, I wonder if you might, because you mentioned the Arctic. Uh, do you believe that, and this is for Mr. Sadler, do you believe that China's degree of compliance with international law of the sea in the South China Sea has any implications for understanding the potential Chinese behavior regarding its compliance with international law in the Arctic? Uh, what lessons can we be learning or should we be learning from the South China Sea as we uh, try to look towards the Arctic and apply that, those lessons? Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, I think it's instructive to note that the Chinese change the, the legal basis or their position based on the geography of the issue at hand. So in the Chell China Sea, it's, it's more of a, 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 a territorial historical basis that doesn't really comport with our and the, uh, the popular understandings, legal understandings of UNCLOS. In the Arctic, the Chinese almost sound like we do. So there's, a, there's an interesting dichotomy that's going on there. So it's instructive as far as it is their pragmatism and where they play very loose with uh, legal constructs. And Mr. I'm sorry, Mr. Russell, do you have anything to contribute there since you brought up the Arctic? Yeah, I think that this is a classic case of Beijing seeking to exploit the inherent rights and freedoms of maritime user states uh, in UNCLOS. Uh, without accepting the limitations uh, and the responsibilities of UNCLOS uh, members. And our ability to directly contest that hypocrisy is uh, curtailed by our status as a, as a non-party state. Thanks very much for that. Uh, I, I'm hopefully, uh, as, as many of us are really looking at what's going on in the Arctic and concerned about the, the possibilities of China's rise, uh, particularly in that area. With the last 40 seconds, um, I just wanted to ask uh, Mr. Swift, Admiral Swift, uh, we were talking, uh, Representative Luria, about the dominance of China and the Navy uh, and, then, and that they have the opportunity with fishing boats, with maritime militia boats, with Coast Guard cutters and naval ships to really flood the, the region uh, with their naval abilities. Uh, and I was just wondering, as a practical matter, what, if anything, could be done to roll back their increasingly dom uh, dominance, increasing dominance in land and sea, uh, if it isn't about solutions with our own, our own Navy? Well, the South China Sea is about the legitimacy of the Communist Party and Xi Jinping himself. So rolling back needs to be cautious, and I think Congress is the right place for that discussion to occur. We have sufficient force in place. What's key is, is readiness, I believe. And just to touch on the Arctic, China describes their responsibility and abilities in the Arctic as driven by the fact that they're a near Arctic state. So the South China Sea is just a petri dish of an overall view that China is applying to the world. Um, but thank you for that question. You're welcome. And I've run out of time, so I yield back. Great. Thanks, um, Mr. Lehan. And let me recognize um, Ms. Jacobs from California. Well, thank you so much, uh, Chair Vera, and thank you to all the witnesses. It's been uh, really interesting so far. Um, I wanted to ask 
I know we've talked a lot about UNCLOS, and I agree with my colleagues that we should ratify it and that there are a lot of drawbacks to not doing so. But let's take as a hypothetical that the Senate does not do what we want them to do and does not ratify it. Um, and I was hoping, uh, Ms. Glazer, you could talk about what other options we might have in that scenario. Um, how would we be able to enforce international law of the sea in South China Sea and East China Sea? Um, and mitigate some of those drawbacks that have been so clearly uh, articulated about not ratifying. Well, thank you for the question, but I'm afraid that I think that there are very few options for the United States to enforce international law in the South China Sea if we are not a member of UNCLOS because we cannot shape the rules. Uh, certainly, we can enforce uh, freedom of navigation by conducting fun ops and presence operations. Uh, we have that uh, option to available to us. We can help by, uh, as others have talked about, uh, bolstering the maritime domain awareness of literal states so that they know what is going on inside of their exclusive economic zones, and that might deter some of uh, China's illegal behavior. Uh, these, th this is an ongoing program that we, of course, should continue to bolster those capabilities. But in terms of international law, UNCLOS is really um, all I think that is basically um, available. Uh, the, uh, the, the Chinese uh, are the ones that have ratified the treaty but are not abiding by it. And the United States, of course, stands outside the treaty, but we are essentially respecting it as a matter of customary law. Um, and I think that many uh, countries in the world don't even understand what that means or why we take this position. It's baffling to the world. Um, and, and the United States, therefore, is, is charged by China, as others have said, um, as being hypocritical. So I don't think we really have the means. I'm not, a, I'm not an international maritime lawyer, but I don't really think we have other legal means um, uh, available to us. We can use diplomatic means, certainly. We can encourage the uh, code of conduct to include the right pr provisions. We have military means, but I don't think there's alternative legal means. Thank you. Do any of the other witnesses want to comment on our I'll, I'll jump in. I'll jump in clo closely, uh, quickly, if I could. And this goes back to. I would agree with Bonnie. The other, the only other alternative is diplomatic. There's a disconnect between diplomacy and what we do in the military, and it goes back to my comments uh, with respect to a relevancy of the United States and now the legitimacy piece. So the problem with FONOPS right now is the United States has drifted from the strategic concept and objectives of FONOPS. Uh, peer competitors recognize this, primary of that uh, being uh, China that's the most advanced and adept at adopting the approach. And they get their word out on a fauna before the U.S. does, and their word is consistent. These are actions of a faded regional uh, colonial hegemony uh, using military power to back up a failed form of government, ensuring the region remains destabilized, and prevent the nations of the region from self-determination. And because of their use of, of force and coercion, other nations are reluctant to speak up. That's why the comment about the EU strategy being published was so important. So we need to take a playbook from our allies, partners, and friends, and be careful about taking a page from the playbook of the PRC and the Chinese Communist Party in our response. That's even more important if we don't become a party to UNCLOS. Congresswoman Danny Russell here. If I could add, um, the situation and the challenge set that the United States and our allies and partners face in the maritime space in the Indo-Pacific is so serious that we simply don't have the luxury of opting to ignore one of the limited tools at our disposal. So legal tools, diplomatic tools, military tools, economic tools, all of these need to be applied as part of a coherent strategy with enough enthusiasm and, and resolve that our partners are convinced that we really mean it, we're here to stay, and that our adversaries are convinced of the same thing. Thank you. Um, Mr. Chair, I yield back. Great, thank you. And um, 
with that, that's our last speaker. And, you know, Mr. Russell, I think you summed it up that, you know, we need an American strategy to, to the region. We as Congress have a, a real role in laying out what that strategy looks like. And we have to play the long game here so that there is certainty um, with our allies in the region, but also certainty that the our adversaries understand that we're here to stay. And again, that takes all of our resources, diplomacy, defense, um, strategic partnerships with, with our allies, and, and you know, in some ways, marrying a transatlantic and trans-Pacific strategy to, together as well. And then I will just put out there having an economic strategy in the region, you know, that, that will allow us to, to, to compete and bring um, nations together. So I, I want to thank um, each of the witnesses for your testimony, your service to, to our country. And with that, the hearing is adjourned.